This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. Also, make sure to check out and subscribe to our YouTube original channel, UCTV Prime, available only on YouTube. So welcome everyone to the first of three conversations with notable scientists here at Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory. My name is Jeff Miller, I'm the Head of Public Affairs and your host. I'm also going to be your voice, kind of the common guy sitting in the chair opposite the very uncommon, uh, uncommonly smart and very uh, world renowned uh, Omar Yagi, who's head of the Molecular Foundry here at the lab which has to be uh, one of the best and coolest titles probably in the whole National Laboratory System, head of the Molecular Foundry. But before we begin the actual conversation, I wanted to talk to you about a larger purpose because people who know me realize that I always do have a hidden purpose and we're going to be talking about the hidden world today. So that purpose is this. Um, there used to be a time in American history when science was at the center of the national conversation when there was no question about science being the source of greatness or economic prosperity or innovation. But something has changed in the last 50 or 60 years. I don't really know why, but it's now kind of an option like a cup of coffee or a vacation destination that we sometimes visit that we maybe like, but we don't spend a lot of time there. And again, I don't know why that's the case. Maybe it's because we've been seduced by the fruits of science, something we call technology. Uh, and because we're an impatient people, we forget about the failure and the long slog that it takes for there to be progress. So today, in our very, very small way, we hope to begin this march back to the center of the national conversation, to the public square. Uh, these conversations will be about uh, inspiration, about motivation, they'll be about questions, about purpose, about why publicly funded science is so necessary, so valuable, and so important to the future of this country. And lastly, we will be talking a lot about the future. And because when you really think about it, the future is all we really have, so we better get it right. So with that, please welcome Omar Yagi, head of the Molecular Foundry. So Omar, if I may call you that. Please do. Okay. Um, I did my own little poll, was the average not very good chemistry student, uh, talking to people about chemistry, non-scientists. And it's interesting to me that the, in the common parlance, chemistry is often referred to in relationship to people and the chemistry that people have between themselves, this transformation that goes on. So I, I want to start with a couple of questions. Number one, if, if the chemistry that you do have any, bear any resemblance to this kind of transformational aspect that happens between people? And again, as kind of the average student in chemistry, what is it about chemistry that I need to know that's going to make me realize that it has value? I, I think um, you know, chemistry is really about atoms and how atoms are connected in space. And uh, of course, uh, a lot of things that we see around us are made of uh, molecules, atoms that make molecules, and molecules that assemble to make larger objects. So for example, you're a collection of proteins and RNAs and DNAs and uh, other things, I'm sure. So when you look at people, uh, do you see structures and things? Do you not really? Um, I do, but I don't recommend that you do. <laughs> <laughs> Why is that? So I mean, I, in, I, I think chemists in general like to dig deeper beneath the, uh, the, 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 the world that we see. I, mean, I think they are really enamored by the hidden, what I call the hidden world. What is behind a phenomena? What is, you know, why does a material behave in the way it does? And not just why, but also how do we make it better? How do we, um, how do we change it? So, so chemistry is not just about what I said, it's not just about the atoms and how they're connected, but also how they transform into other things. How so there is a transformational quality. Ab absolutely. Okay. So these we call chemical reactions. And again, they 
happen in our body. They happen in many important uh, uh, processes that lead to wonderful products. So let, let's get basic for a second. Um, describe to me this hidden world. Um, what you see. I mean, what, what, I, what I see is, um, um, is uh, really I see drawings of, of structures, and, and they're mobile. They move around and uh, collide into each other, and, and reactions are, um, uh, are made, and there are products, and these products go on to do, to do things. So um, I, I was always intrigued by the idea, even when I was a child, the idea that, uh, that you can really uncover something or un unveil something that, that would be hidden behind what you're what you're seeing, so it's almost like a, you know, it's a it's a discovery, it's it's exploration uh, of an unknown world and knowing the secrets of how it works, and so, you know, to me that's sort of a, a privilege that I have, to be able to to know that above and beyond what might be obvious. So when did this? Was there a, a moment when uh, you became interested in molecules, this hidden world? Was there a mentor or uh, something that you can describe that had happened in your childhood? Well, I think I'd, I mean, uh, in general, I was always interested in, I think my, uh, my original interest in how things work came from physiology. And, uh, you know, going down the market and watching uh, carcasses of animals and things like that, and wondering, you know, what different parts, you know, how do they operate and things like that. So you but, hung out at butcher shops. This is in Amman, in Jordan, sure, where you grew yeah, up. Yeah. Okay. Main Street in and Amman. How old were you then? King Talal Street. How old were you then? I was very young, uh, five years old. Well, I used to pass through there to go to school. So, so what did you learn uh, when you looked at the butcher shops? <laughs> well, I think more relevant really is uh, because I didn't really like that so much. It, was, it wasn't, there wasn't enough there for me to, you know, chemists are really about controlling things, right? Chemists love to put things exactly where they want them. And, and atoms and molecules, as a lot of people know, are, n are not easy to control. And so we spend a lot of time as chemists trying to control matter on that, on that scale. The nanoscale. So, so as a child, I, you know, I went into school one day, and I saw that the library was closed and it should be open in the middle of the day. And I went in the, in and started, you know, I secretly went in. The door was unlocked, and I started leafing through a book, and there I saw what I see now, behind objects. These, these these spheres that are connected to each other, what we call now stick and ball diagrams. And they were, they were of very simple molecules like water and, and natural gas, methane, mostly methane. So, so to me at that time, I realized that that's, you know, that was, a, that was unique. It so was, was, it was very that, attractive then? to me to realize, is that really water? That was very interesting. So, because it, it meant that I knew something about the hidden, this hidden world, about the makeup of this hidden world. When you talk a lot about structure, was there something about the structure? Was there some art, artistic light that went on in, in your brain as well, do you suppose? No, it just was something new. I was very interested in it. Okay. Yep. So, were you interested in other things? Like, did you play sports? No, I mean, no. no, I was no? actually, sport was my worst topic. <laughs> How so? Um, uh, the, our teacher <laughs> would constantly push me into the field while the kids are playing, and I would always sit on the sideline watching them play, and probably not even just have my eyes open, but uh -huh. probably thinking about something else, I don't know. But, uh, but anyway, I would, that was my worst topic. Okay. Yeah. So, but in general, I was, you know, I, yeah, I mean, growing up, I was, uh, I would sit in a corner and read and uh, write, whatever. Uh, and draw, But perhaps? in general, for example, I don't know how to bike. I don't know how, I'm, I'm horribly terrified of 
of projectiles, you know, balls coming at you, you know, <laughs> soccer. They didn't, I don't like that They didn't at make all. you play dodgeball in Jordan. <laughs> no, they, no. Yeah. Good, that's good. No, okay. Yeah. That's good. But I think, I think at the heart of it, if, if I think back at my childhood, I think what was attractive to me was knowing the makeup of something that is so common as water or natural gas, to know that what it, what it's, what it looks like, what the molecules look like, that was quite attractive. And it sort of brought out this, what I still feel today is this explorational uh, mentality of approaching chemistry as a, as, as a world where you can explore new things and develop new things, so. You mentioned that chemists like to change and control things. So yes. Well, we first want to control them, then change them. Right. Okay. <laughs> control, then change. Um, to some, that might sound a little like you're, it's not really about discovery. It's about, well, it is about control, maybe manipulation. Well, I think at some point, uh, after you've explored and found, you want to understand and you want to try to manipulate things so that you bend nature in ways that, that nature doesn't want to do for some advantage that you think might be derived from that. You know, for example, a chemist could twist around an atom in a molecule and turn a molecule from being a poison into medicine. So it's that type of control that you want to have on, the, on this hidden world to allow you to, to do beneficial things. What do you say to people who would hear the phrase bend nature and they would be aghast? Have you had conversations with, with people who would be aghast at that term? Uh, no, I didn't actually. Yeah. No. Well, I, what would I you think say? I mean I'm in general in general I'm we're trying we are trying to learn from nature, trying to understand nature, but also uh, the non biological world is about transferring concepts from nature into uh, synthetic materials, into the, the things that make our life more convenient and things that, like I mentioned, pharmaceuticals and things like that that make, that, that, that make our lives better. So did you start out with this idea? You, st you said that you were interested no, in scratching. No, I, I yeah. didn't. Okay. No, so I, how I didn't. did this evolve? to a position where you actually think that I, I can do things for the public benefit. What's the trajectory there of your career? Let's, get, let's ask it that way. Um, I, I don't know. I was always interested in the beauty of molecules. And since I didn't have Tinker Toys when I was growing up, I guess I started thinking, well, how do I, what happens if I start linking things together? It turns out that when I was a graduate student, that that was really a huge challenge. Sticking things together to make larger objects mean, meant that you, that you completely lost that control over their order and you made materials that were not characterizable, call them amorphous materials. So I wasn't attracted to working on amorphous materials because I thought, you know what, I, I can only live one lifetime and I'd rather work with things I can identify uh, rather than spend a lot of time on a material trying to identify what it's made, but rather I can try to fix the chemistry in such a way as to make them crystalline. Turns out that, that crystalline means ordered was a huge challenge. And so if you could overcome this challenge of um, uh, try, you know, this crystallization challenge, you could then have control over building whatever structure that, uh, that you want. And, I, and, and very early on, we were able to overcome this challenge uh, using different, you know, just trying to control the chemistry and different tricks in the chemistry to, to crystallize, to trick these molecules or these larger structures into crystallizing. But once you crystallize a material, now you can go and figure out exactly how it's made, how it's connect, how the atoms and molecules are connected within the structure, and then you can begin to ask questions, well, what if I start changing this part and this part, what, how does that impact the properties? But, you know, I mean, when I started my independent career as a researcher at Arizona State University, I really just wanted to make beautiful molecules and 
and I didn't care whether I get tenure or not. I was I was so happy that I had my own lab and uh, and and startup funds. <laughs> so you would make these beautiful mo me. molecules and then and see what they could do, or what? what what did you well, do I mean, initially, initially we were very excited because you can make them. Because, mm. you know, it was, it was really exciting because we, you can take inorganic units and organic units and stitch them together into very large structures. And you had control over both of these chemistries. And now you've combined two chemistries that people originally thought were separate. The inorganic and the organic. The, in, the organic and the inorganic. And the potential is huge because you know, you've got the whole periodic table to work with on the inorganic side, and you've got libraries of organic molecules that are known that you, one can use in this process of building, of building structures. Okay. So, if I may so ask, this, may interrupt yeah. one second. So yeah. just for, for the yeah, don't get me person when you now, talk, I but mean, I know, I, I, mean, I, I want to get you started. But uh, <laughs> the, the scale, when we talk about these large structures, so for the regular person, what are you talking about large structures? How, give me a sense of how large uh, is large. They, yeah, I mean, they, they range uh, in, in size. They can go from the nano size to a size that we can see with our own eyes. Assemblies can become large enough that you can actually see them in the form of crystals just like a, a piece of diamond, let's say. Okay. Um, so. Um, and we're all chemists equally curious about this inorganic, organic fusion, if I may call it that? I think most, most chemists are, um, yeah, I mean, maybe the feelings I'm, I've just expressed, maybe not uncommon among chemists. I think we're all excited about this exploration and discovery, trying to find out how we can make new things, and what are these new things going to do? Um, so, and, and some of us who are lucky enough to discover the right thing uh, that has eventually benefit to society see the fruits of that labor, and many, many of us are quite happy just making molecules because they're very beautiful. But it, it goes really beyond that because because basic research, which is doing things for the sake of advancing knowledge, is also a, an intellectual, you're overcoming an intellectual uh, challenge. You're addressing an intellectual challenge. And when we started doing this chemistry, it wasn't obvious to me how they would be applied. I mean, I had, I had some hunch, but I was, it wasn't, to me, it wasn't exciting to just improve up on a property just because you can functionalize and vary the components. Um, we were trying to address a challenge of how do you take molecules, the makeup of things, the makeup of living things and, and, and synthetic things, how do you take these building units and stitch them together into variously shaped uh, molecules and extended structures uh, that has much wider impact than just making a good material for, you know, storing natural gas. Okay, so let's and talk about, yeah. if, let's, let's get to that now, because we're talking about something that, if I went to Google and, and typed in Omar Yagi and metal organic uh, frameworks, how many citations would I see? A lot? I have no idea, but I imagine quite a few, yeah. Okay, so that's what you're most famous for, I believe, or maybe some other things I don't know about which we <laughs> yeah, can discuss. Maybe not. Uh, but so a metal organic framework, uh, MOFs, I believe they are called. So tell, tell me about them. And again, you talked about the impact and the impact on society, on the public. What can they do for us? Well, MOFs, uh, as they are now called, um, uh, essentially they are they're porous uh, crystals, or some people call them porous sponges. And so they, they can store um, the first, let's say, wave of applications is deals with storing of uh, storage of gases. So, just to make it uh, uh, really a simple analogy, is that if you take, let's say, a container filled with a moth, you can store more gas in that container than a container that doesn't have moth, which seems a little strange and like magic. But the reason you can store more gas is because by virtue of having the MOF material being attractive to that gas, you can stack gas molecules within their pores a lot closer than those gas molecules would be had the material not been there. 
gas molecules like to stay away from each other. They repel each other. Mm -hmm. But when, by virtue of having the moth material act like a honey, in a honeycomb, you can assemble gas molecules and stack them, let's say, as you would uh, stack cars in a car park closer to each other, overcoming their repulsions and therefore storing more gas. So capturing carbon, for example. Capturing carbon is another, is another potential uh, application. There's a lot of interest right now in uh, uh, using MOFs, specially designed MOFs by virtue of the chemistry that is being developed now by many groups around the world of tweaking the substituents on the, on the components in such a way as to seek out just carbon dioxide from among a host of other gases like nitrogen and oxygen that exist all around us. So to be able to create a material that can seek out a small molecule like carbon dioxide from other molecules like it, other gas molecules that look very similar in size and shape to, CO to carbon dioxide is, is quite clever of that material. Okay, and perhaps so, of the chemist too. And hopefully this then would have impact on, there's a lot of interest because MOFs are easy to make. They're, they've been demonstrated to be scaled up to multi-ton quantities. Many things, many of the good things you need to see in a material exist in, in, these, in some of these MOFs. Okay, so would we envision a future where MOFs would be arrayed or deployed along freeways, for example, to actually you take can. carbon out Yes, you, you can. You can envision that. What would yeah. be the practical use of that? <laughs> so what would be, the other pra what would be another practical use, maybe that's more visionable? Um, I, I mean, I think that, uh, that, that the, the chemistry now is so sophisticated that if you think about how enzymes work, where there's, you know, there's a pocket into which, let's say, a substrate comes in and gets transformed into something else. Let's say methane going to methanol. Mm. Uh, that pocket is, is a, is a well-defined entity that has a heterogeneous uh, composition of molecules and different metals in different uh, connectivities. And this heterogeneity makes that a unique entity that can be very specific to this useful transformation. Well, imagine if we can create that inside a MOF structure such that the MOF interior is like a vessel that is tailor-made to transform natural gas into a fuel, into liquid fuel. Or instead of pumping carbon dioxide under the ground after we capture it, why not take carbon dioxide and convert that into a liquid fuel? Why not? Using these entities. Well, because the basic science of doing that has, is, is just beginning to, 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 to be pursued. Uh, we need, you know, there's, there should be, we don't know a lot about the chemistry of carbon dioxide outside, outside the body. And, and, uh, <coughs> And so, so we need more attention uh, to be paid to, to developing the chemistry and reactivity. We discuss transformations, which is, which is how you're gonna get to these liquid fuels. We need to understand the chemistry better. How does carbon dioxide interact with, the, with its environment? So is this a problem that you're working on? This is a problem that not just I'm working on, but many other scientists are. This is a major effort all around the world. I mean, a huge effort is being, is being made here at LBL and, and at, at, at uh, University of California, Berkeley. So, so this is a huge problem and, uh, and uh, we need to address this problem. This is, it's urgent. The reason we're capturing carbon dioxide now is because we have no other way to do it. We're just storing it under the ground and because we have no better way of there's just so much of it. Um, we need to understand the chemistry so that we can convert it to fuel and make it make it. If it had to be stored underground, could we extract it and then turn it into a fuel? If, if, if the timing of the of the research did not exactly work out. Uh, ultimately, yes. If it, um, yeah, ultimately you should be able to do that. Okay. Um, 
this seems like uh, what we would call very big science, even if it's on a small scale, um, the hidden world scale. Is that something that, uh, when you think about Berkeley Lab, that is an attribute of this place, being able to look at big problems and sort of develop interdisciplinary teams? Well, I think that's a strength of, of this lab, and it's an attractive place to, you know, it's attractive, exciting, I think, exciting place to do this kind of science. Converting CO2 into liquid fuel is a huge problem, and not one scientist can solve that problem on their own. This, new, this requires many great minds to come together, and LBL, I think, uh, is, a, is a great place to do that. It has demonstrated strength in, the, in forming teams to address problems from beginning to, you know, down all the way to fruition. It seems to me, too, as you talk about these metal organic frameworks, that you're, you're, you seem to be learning a lot about new materials. So could, if that's the case, can we foresee a future in which you can imbue materials with qualities that we can't possibly imagine now? A little science fiction, science fantasy question. Yeah, I mean, oftentimes, the things that you think you are going after when you're doing basic, basic science, as I do, um, in the end, transform themselves into something, something else because we, ha we look at what we make and, and different scientists can look at the same thing, but actually their view might be different about what it means and how it can be used. And that's really the strength of approaching science in that way. And so, you know, when we first started doing MOF chemistry, I didn't realize that we would be here where they are poised to be deployed now as natural gas storage materials and in the near future, hopefully, carbon dioxide capture materials and many, many other uh, applications. Um, but had I started there, looking at the application first and then pursued a solution to that application, we would not have opened up all these different possibilities. Uh, in terms of what is the future of MOF looks like, where is this going, is that now if you can, if you have control over uh, decorating the interior with these organic units and then varying the metals, now you can start thinking about maybe you can design sequences of functional groups in the, in the MOF that code for very specific properties. As I mentioned earlier in, in the, my initial remarks, just tweaking or rotating an atom or, or a group of atoms, just a few degrees makes a huge difference in chemistry, in transforming a molecule from one state to another, uh, or transforming a molecule from, let's say, uh, fr from, uh, uh, let's say, natural gas into a, into a liquid fuel or something like that. So, so could we, um, we know that now we can design these multi-functionalized systems and we, 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 we think that we have sequences just like you would have sequences of nucleotides in DNA. These sequences are going to dictate our properties in a very, very precise way. And that's really, it's a dream come true for, for material scientists. But it comes with a challenge. These are new questions and, and that has, have never been asked before. What is that sequence? Okay, we know a lot about the system metrically and we know it's ordered and everything, but we don't know what is next to what. But if and, we did know, could we maybe design shape-shifting materials? Yeah, I mean, I think always, uh, once you figure it out, you can do a lot of different things with it. But in this particular case, the exciting thing is that there, the, you, you're asking new questions, but also the tools to identify these sequences are not known. So we need to develop new tools. That's a perfect arena for scientists to come together to create something much, much larger than what we are doing now. And that's, that's, that's what I'm excited about. And this work takes place at the Molecular Foundry? This, uh, it, well, um, as you know, many people now are working on MOFs all around LBL, Berkeley campus. A lot of founder scientists are very interested in, in MOFs. Um, but I think it's going to happen everywhere. So uh, 
I think teams are beginning to form to try to address this problem at LBL. So again, this is very exciting. Okay, well let's talk a little bit about how the Molecular Foundry is structured. And for those who don't know, um, they're called, it's called a user facility. It has nothing to do with a drug clinic. I made that mistake when I first came to the lab. Uh, but uh, why don't you explain what a user facility is and then how the Molecular Foundry itself is organized because it actually is, uh, but not only performs a great service, but it's actually a very uh, central to uh, operations here at the lab. The Molecular Foundry uh, is about um, make a, making connection to researchers all around the world, from the U.S. and around the world. And the way we make these connections is that our own scientists do great research, that the world wants to come and work with them. And so, so this happens in a, in a dual mode where a scientist would do their own research to develop expertise in a certain area and, and be known for that. But also, they give this expertise to users that come to the foundry to use facilities and for the most part at the foundry is an unusual user facility in that a lot of people come to not just use instruments but also uh, collaborate and, and develop uh, their own expertise in what this foundry scientist is doing. And uh, this is actually quite powerful because what you're teaching, let's say a user from another, another university that, that is at the foundry, you're teaching them know-how. And uh, know-how is something that you can't read about. It's, it's not something you can publish. It's not something you can patent. It's because it's, it's science mixed in with art. And so you need this one-on-one -on -one interaction, which we have a lot of at the foundry. This is really how we, how we work. So our scientists have figured out a way of balancing their own research with the user interaction. And, and so they feed into each other. The user comes in with their own expertise, collaborate with, with the founder scientists, and the founder scientists giving their own expertise. And so there is a, a give and take interaction that in the end, uh, as one would say, the whole is really much better than the sum of the parts. There are many examples like this at the foundry. And Another thing that's great about the foundry, I think, is and it's quite attractive to me, I'm, I'm really delighted to be among these scientists of the foundry, is that most places operate in a, in a horizontal fashion. The foundry, we have the horizontal fashion. We build our core facilities in many different diverse areas from polymers to inorganic chemistry to biological uh, chemistry and molecules, theory, uh, nano fabrication and, and, uh, and imaging, nano imaging and so on. These are quite diverse uh, expertise that cover chemistry, biology, physics. They're all in one spot. And so many of our scientists don't just operate horizontally within their own area of expertise, but they also cross floors. That's the power of the foundry, is that once you start crossing disciplines, now you can solve big, big challenges. And so, so you know, so, so that's, that, that's, that's exciting. So this notion that some may still have, a very old notion, obviously, of the scientist working alone just is not obviously a real view. It's all strength in teams and... I, ironically, I went into science because I wanted to be alone. You did? Actually, yes, I wanted to be left alone. I didn't want anybody to talk yeah, to me. I think you picked the wrong career. You know? In fact, when I was growing up, I refused to show my parents my report card because I felt I need to be quite independent of them. And I should be able to do my own job. Why should they be checking up on me? So, <laughs> so I was quite offended by them asking me to show them this, my report card. So, so I went into science because I thought it would be a solitary. Uh, and when did you learn science? otherwise? <laughs> oh. I, I at an uncomfortably young age, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, as I became an independent researcher, I realized that, that you have to earn your independence by making sure that there is plenty of interactions. And, and I think, uh, you know, I, I think it's, uh, I'm now a believer, having seen 
a place like the how the a place like the foundry operates. Okay. We're going to take a moment now to see if anyone in the audience actually has questions. We have some mics up here. I'm going to check. Does anyone? Okay. I can continue, but I want to make sure that folks in the audience actually have a chance if there are some specific questions you'd like to ask. We have one right here, John. Oh. Hi, um, I'm a, an intern working at NERSC, and I spend a lot of time with software for simulating atoms and molecules. And I also spend a lot of time considering the limitations of that software. Are there any limitations in the field of chemistry right now that you think are perhaps in the near future going to be overcome and that it's going to be exciting, specifically because maybe computational systems are getting more advanced? Yeah, I mean, I think. Uh the work that you're doing, for example, that once you start, once you have a way of taking building units and connecting them together to make not just MOFs, but a lot of different structures of different chemical composition of different properties, then you need computation to not just tell you what kind of structure you need to get to what property, but you also need uh, need computation to tell you which structures are important enough to go after. I'm a synthetic chemist, so I, you know, I have students that go into the lab and, and do stuff. So it would be nice to tell them, well, which structures are the most likely to form so that they don't waste their whole PhD thesis searching for something that is not there. Um, but so that would be helpful. I think it adds richness to the way we think. But quite honestly, I don't, in general, I don't feel that we should be thinking in terms of limits. This is really the golden age of, of chemistry. This is a golden age of science, is that a lot of the things that I thought in my own research, which I'm supposed to be an expert on, uh, that we would be limited by, uh, my students prove over and over again that I'm wrong. And so I gave up. I gave up saying that this is, gonna, this is not going to work, or that you know, this kind of material will not form because they've, they've, they're constantly surprising me and I'm delighted. Thank you. So while we wait for the next, uh, I want to go back to this vision of this artificial synthetic future. And the reason is because I work in public affairs and so we sort of interface with a lot of folks in the community who are always alarmed by these the, their sense that nature being altered in a way that over which we have no control and usually devolves to the question about safety. How can we be sure that these artificial things that you're creating are not going to escape and do something terrible to my world because it's always about how it affects humans on the outside? Well, look, so, I mean, a, a typical moth is made from components mm -hmm. of plastics that we drink water out of and uh, and uh, another component is uh, we put on our skin a sunscreen. So I think uh, the other thing is that they're, they're not soluble materials. If this ends up in an automobile, a fuel tank, it would be there for the lifetime of that automobile. We're not going to take it out. And, and then every time you refuel, you have to change the material and then cause a, a problem. So uh, that's the beauty, I think, of, of, of of science is that whatever challenge you have, you can you know, it can be addressed. This material, at the end of the day, you just add acid; it decomposes into its the components that you put in there in the in the in the beginning and reassemble it, and then put another fuel tank. So it's a zero potentially it's a zero discharge process. Is there profit in that? Is there profit? Of course. Okay. Of course. There's a question over here. Yep. Uh, I, I just wondered, uh, um, I work in public affairs and, and a lot of what we do is to document the historical development of the lab as we move from a physics lab to, uh, to being the multidisciplinary lab we are now. And, and of course the team science idea was something that Lawrence was, was known for, for beginning when working with people outside of his discipline. Um, and, and working vertically. And, but I wonder, as a solitary scientist, when you, what really attracted you to the lab? Was it 
that idea that you were going to do that team science or that you just discovered no. when you got here? That no, I wasn't attracted to team science at all. I, I wanted to go in the lab and do my own thing, and I wanted, wanted to be left alone. I didn't want my professor to talk to me or anybody. But it turns out that that interaction was quite beneficial because you know, my PhD advisor actually is spending two years with me. He's actually right here in LBL. Um, who mentored me, now I am mentoring him. Um, but, but he, I mean, he was a very important force in my life, not just my intellectual development, but, you know, learning how to be a good scientist doesn't just come to us in our DNA. I think this is something that, that we receive in mentoring and that interaction with our professor, uh, that selfless giving on the part of the mentors and at the same time, that un, uh, well, un, what should I say, unrestrained criticism of 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 a job not well done. Okay, so so I think that combination is very is very important to striving to to do the right, you know, experiment or to to be uh, to to be a good scientist. And so. I, I want to go back to two points. One is bending nature. I think what I, I, I don't want to say that I'm bending nature. It's not, I, I think that we are trying to create things. Um, of course, you can't, you know, uh, force nature to do things, right? But we are trying to uncover things that are not well known. And so, um, so this, this becomes more of a philosophical discussion but the the other the other thing I want to say is that I think a lot of very important discoveries in the at the outset happened because of soul uh, scientist effort team science contributes beyond that point contributes to solving a big a big problem that has very complex components so so there is a we have to make sure that the two Aspects are preserved in in a science in a science enterprise. So, how about the value of basic science? Again, that's a tough concept to explain to folks because they're they're obviously interested in the application in the product, as I mentioned in the opening remarks. So, obviously, you're at the the basic level. If you were explaining that to folks and explaining the this the continuum from the very basic to the applied, what is the what is the value? How, how do we make people understand that? Well, I think the I think in, in basic science we're solving problems, and who doesn't want to solve problems? I mean, we we want to solve problems in all aspects of our life, not just scientific problems. But the the thing you're learning. When you're solving problem, a scientific problem, you're, sol you're, you're also learning how to solve many other problems. Okay, so, so, it, so basic science is not just about uh, Professor Yagi going to the laboratory and, uh, or his students going to the laboratory and making new things. It's also about strategies and how do you solve problems, right? Be comfortable with failure. Right? You go in the lab and you fail, and you, you fail miserably every day. You get up every morning and go into the lab and you fail. You fail, you fail, you fail, and you fail. And then there is a success. And you know, we tell our students, well, those are increments of success towards the big success. <laughs> but they are, you know, I mean, it is a, research is a very tough thing, and it, it requires a very special mind to, to be able to stand the failure because there might be a success down the road. So this is not a trivial thing. And so in basic science, this is, you learn that, right? That and and it's, not, it's a very American idea. Americans, when they fail, they get up and they, they, they are expected to succeed. In other cultures, when you fail, you're doomed. You can't come up, you, you, know, you, can't, you, can't, you can't recover. So, so, it's, it's, so basic science is not is not an aspect of American society that, that is dissociated from who we are. It, it is what we are. It's about going into something, exploring, failing, having goals, failing to, to, to get there. But in the meantime, you're learning about, about nature, about, about how and, 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 and how to get, how to become better 
at solving the problem. And ultimately, success reveals itself. But you also need time, and isn't that the virtue of a publicly funded science enterprise versus a privately funded one? Because uh, Yeah, you need time, and, uh, but you have to make sure that, that that time is well spent so that you're not wasting money. But a series of failures over and over and over, as is often the case in science. Yeah, but what is failure in the laboratory? Failure because maybe you didn't, maybe you set your bar too high, right? Then you call that failure, right? So failures are truly increments of success. That's really the, if you didn't fail, you probably will not be able to discover. Are there other questions from the audience? This one right here. Um, I wanted to know, um, did you have to leave Jordan in order to pursue um, this kind of work? Was it uh, hard to leave your home country to, I don't know if you came to America to study or just you came to America to, to teach or, you know, what was the, uh, do you ever go back to Jordan and share some of your uh, science or uh, mentoring? I was just curious about that part of your life. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, I, uh, one day I came back from school. Uh, I was in ninth grade, and my, my father said, you have a choice. You can go to the Soviet Union, become a doctor paid for by the, by the system, and, or you can go to America and work for it. And, uh, and I said, uh, I don't want to do either. I want to stay. I want to stay here. I was in ninth grade. And he said, well, there, that's not an option. And so I was shipped off to Troy, New York, where an older brother was there. And, uh, um, uh, and so I lived nearby. And uh, I had to stand on my own feet. Uh, I don't think this is a remarkable story at all. I, I, I work with developing countries. and try to build centers of excellence in, in developing countries. And it's, not an, it's, not, it's very common for people to sacrifice uh, their family life and so on to seek a better, better life and uh, go after their passion. So it, in retrospect, I should have had more fun. But you know, I was nervous making sure that I go to school and make sure that I can pay my tuition and things like that. But, but uh, that's, that's a story very common, I think, in some places in America, in, in developing countries, yeah. There was another question here. I'm interested in your comments about uh, nature. And uh, it, it occurs to me that there are some models in chemistry and, uh, and in material sciences uh, that occur naturally, uh, but that you can then take as an inspiration, perhaps. And I wonder if uh, you might, uh, I mean, moths themselves, uh, there are geological structures that are somewhat similar. Uh, if you could uh, talk about uh, the re relationship between inspiration uh, from nature and, and your own uh, inspiration. Yeah, I mean, I think I, I like that. I think, I think we can be inspired by how nature does things. We're doomed if we think we can duplicate how they na mimic nature. But we would be well served, I think, to concept transfer from nature. How does a concept like, let's say, DNA, and how does nature count? How does nature keep track of things? And try to take that concept and say, well, how do I manifest this in a synthetic material and put it to good, good, to good use, as I, as I described in the case of making, let's say, liquid fuel? So inspiration, I think, is very inspire, you know, being inspired by nature is very important. But that's nature, and nature does things in a very specific way because it had a lot of time to, to develop it. Making the moths or making any other artificial material in the laboratory, uh, we make things that have not been discovered in nature. Uh, they may be out there, I don't know. But, but, uh, but we, we always, we're very interested in, in how nature works. Yeah, but we should concept transfer from nature rather than trying to mimic, mimic nature. 
Uh, just as a follow-up on that, I um, uh, once met a chemist uh, at UCLA who was uh, involved in uh, building these new kinds of structures, uh, including clathrates, and uh, he would carry around a bag of uh, tinker toys, basically, on the bus, and he would you know, play around with putting these things together. But this was 20 years ago, and I'm wondering, uh, what kinds of tools do you have to uh, do synthetic chemistry now? Well. Um in, in terms of carrying tinker toys around, you, when you make a new structure, uh, first of all, it's really an exhilarating experience. When you look at that, when you've an analyzed the crystals and you figured out what the structure is and it emerges from that hidden world that I referred to, that is an auxiliary, that's a rush that comes through your body. And that's a moment you never forget. The other thing is that to understand that structure, you really have to take those tinker toys and put them together. And if you come to my office in, uh, on campus, you'll see that I have, um, I don't have any book, well, I have three, four books, but, but that's it. I have models, we call them molecular models, and, and those were made mostly by me, but also some of my students, because the only way to understand a structure is by building that model on your own, sticking them together just like they, they would have during, the, during your chemistry, during your reaction. So once you do that, you will not forget that structure. And so this is a very good way to keep, to keep these things in your, in your mind. The way that chemistry works in the lab is, is actually it's, it's embarrassingly simple. You take a solution that has a metal ion in it, you take a a solution that has an organic material, you mix them together and out comes the stuff. So there are a few tricks here and there that you have to play in order for them to form ordered, to become, to, to, to come out as ordered form. But really, I mean, it's, it's, it's not, uh, it's not a, an 18 step process. You know, okay, it's a, I would say it's at a, home that you know do you, your chemistry sets at home. Those are actually useful, actually, to uh, the kids play with. I, I was I, I was told that they're interesting for young children. You know. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Um, a little word association game to close. I know you came from UCLA, so the, before we get to the word association, let me ask you this. Is there a, a difference between the UCLA frame of mind and the Berkeley lab frame of mind? Um, to put you on the spot? M maybe you should invite me again next year after I've had time here. But I mean, I think so far, well, I mean, LBL is, is, is smaller than UCLA. And I don't mean in terms of the science, but just overall, that's mm -hmm. a university that's at least 40,000 students right. and faculty. So it's a different, different atmosphere. I, th I mean, this is where you can really dig into, into materials and try to understand them. This is, this is a very special place. Was there something about the history here, the ingenuity, the independence of mind that, was, that attracted you? Yeah, the consistently great scientists that have that are here or have passed through here. Of course, that that was <laughs> that was a main component of my decision. Okay. Right. All right. Uh, so, a little word association. Um, explore. What comes to mind? I say the word explore. What comes to mind? I, I don't know this game, but what? Okay. Uh, well, I'm Think sorry. of a word. Uh, the first word that comes to, comes to mind. I say explore. Oh, explore. What comes to mind? Um, molecules. Okay. Connect. Uh, reticular chemistry. <laughs> Don't ask what that is. Success. Um, nature papers. <laughs> Art. Um, I, molecular models. Science. Molecular models. <laughs> Berkeley Lab. Okay, and Berkeley Lab. No, uh, the term Berkeley Lab. What, oh, the Berkeley Lab. Yeah. Ber Berkeley Lab. Um, I, I think great people. You know. Well, we've reached the end of the hour. Uh, I'd like you all to please thank Omar Yagi for appearing with us today. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I will be back again next week with uh, Kathy Yellick, the ALD for Computing Sciences. And so we'll be talking about supercomputing and a lot of other related items. Thank you all for coming.